Okay, welcome back for more human physiology. So let's go ahead and finish off this chapter on bone physiology by bringing in a discussion on some relevant hormones. So one of the first things to understand about what we're going to discuss here is that calcium homeostasis is central to bones, right? We already talked about how one of the non-mechanical functions of bone is to act as a calcium reservoir. Well, the issue here is that calcium is a element, so it's not something that the body can just make. It has to be obtained through the diet, but in addition to that, making sure that you're getting enough calcium through the diet, you need to make sure that you can actually absorb what calcium you do get through what you eat uh, and what you drink into the bloodstream. So to that end, the hormone vitamin D is going to be necessary to do that. So vitamin D, contrary to popular opinion, uh, so you may have heard the connection with sunlight, which there is something to that, but the sun does not beam down vitamin D to you. It's not something that you absorb like uh, the warmth that you get from the sun. Vitamin D is something that you make yourself. You actually produce it in the cells of your skin. The reason why sunlight is necessary is because that vitamin D that you produce yourself is pretty inactive. It doesn't really do a whole lot for you on its own. So the UV radiation from the sun, which has quite a bit of energy to it, will actually break a couple of bonds within that vitamin D that you produce yourself, and that bond breaking will actually activate the vitamin D and and convert it into its active form. So that's why you need sunlight for your vitamin D. It's not that you're getting vitamin D from the sun, it's that the energy from the sunlight breaks a bond within the vitamin D and activates it, meaning that it can actually have more potent effects. You can obtain uh, active forms of vitamin D through the diet. So you've probably seen milk that's labeled uh, excellent source of vitamin D. So there's something to that as well. So if that's the case, the liver and the kidneys will play a role in metabolizing vitamin D into its final fully active form. Something we can also discuss is that vitamin K does show some synergistic effects with vitamin D. So it's all fine and well if you've got your vitamin D to help you absorb calcium in the intestines. You'll get a much more uh, significant and potent effect if vitamin K is there as well. As well. Uh, fluoride ions can uh, actually replace calcium within ossified matrix, forming what's called fluorapatite instead of hydroxyapatite. So fluoride in the diet can actually help to replace any calcium that has been lost because of a loss of bone density. So nowhere is this more apparent than in your teeth. So the reason why you brush your teeth with fluoride toothpaste is because when uh, you're T uh, the bone in your teeth decay over time and lose calcium. When you brush your teeth, you are replacing the lost calcium with fluoride ions. So in general, uh, the various hormones that we're going to talk about here, so you can see uh, some of the minerals to talk about there. So there should be a table uh, that we'll see a little bit later on that discusses various hormones. Most of these hormones that we're gonna talk about that uh, help to regulate calcium homeostasis are going to act by changing the activities of either osteoblasts or osteoclasts and shift the balance as necessary. So the first one we can talk about growth hormone. Hopefully you remember which endocrine gland makes growth hormone. If not, I suggest you go look it up. Growth hormone will stimulate chondrocyte proliferation near the epiphyseal plate, and it will stimulate that longitudinal bone growth that we talked about in the previous video. And it also stimulates osteoblast activity to increase mineralization. So this is all contingent upon the epiphyseal plate still being open. So if it's not open, growth hormone is not unfortunately going to make you taller. Thyroid hormone will also stimulate osteoblast activity and promote bone matrix formation. That's collagen plus the deposited minerals. And then sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen can play a similar, similar role during puberty and help to influence the closing of the epiphyseal plate. So two of the main ones that we want to talk about here are parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Parathyroid hormone, of course, comes from the parathyroid, and calcitonin comes from the thyroid itself. 
So these two are going to influence the activity of osteoclasts, but in slightly different way. But ultimately, it is still about calcium homeostasis. Is calcium too high or is calcium too low? Which hormone we're going to use is just going to depend on which situation we're dealing with. So we've already talked a little bit about parathyroid hormone and how it stimulates the kidneys to reabsorb calcium back into the blood. It stimulates the intestines to uh, absorb calcium from the food that we eat, obviously in concert with vitamin D. But parathyroid hormone's effect on bone is that it stimulates osteoclast proliferation and activity, meaning that osteoclast activity is going to go up and you are going to resorb bone, lose a little bit of bone density, all for the sake of increasing the amount of calcium in the plasma. So parathyroid hormone obviously is going to respond to the stimulus of low levels of calcium in the blood. So there will be times in which you do need to resorb a little calcium from the bone. And then calcitonin, which we've already established comes from the thyroid, will actually do the opposite. It lowers plasma calcium levels when they are too high by virtue of inhibiting osteoclast activity. So that would shift the balance in favor of the osteoblasts, meaning that since the osteoclasts are kind of being quiet, those osteoblasts can take some of that extra calcium and pack it into the bone matrix to reduce the level of calcium in the blood. So we talked about different hormonal interactions in chapter 17. We talked about synergism, permissiveness, and antagonism. Which one do you think is happening here? So if we look at some consequences of disrupted calcium homeostasis, persistently low calcium levels is what we call hypocalcemia. And your immediate thought is probably, okay, hypocalcemia is a big deal because we don't want to lose bone density. It makes the bones brittle and it's gonna make life a living hell, right? Well, that's very true, but it's not the only reason we should be concerned about not having enough calcium around. So in addition to calcium being a major comp a mineral component of the bone, we've already seen how calcium can act as a very important second messenger in cell signaling pathways, including, as we're going to see later on in the semester, muscle contraction. Calcium is absolutely central to and essential to muscle contraction, so you don't want to be running low on calcium if you're planning on using those muscles of yours. Reducing the amount of calcium all over the body is going to affect the nervous system because it will throw off the membrane potential of cells. We have not quite talked about membrane potentials, but that will be a major focus for us in Unit 3 when we start talking about the nervous system. And then if you look at the opposite scenario, having too much calcium being hypercalcemia, this will have a similar effect on the nervous system as well. You're changing the membrane potential of various cells, including neurons, and that's going to change their ability to send electrical messages all over the place. Okay, so here's table 6.6 .6 that I referenced earlier. We've talked about most of these growth hormone, thyroid hormones, sex hormones, uh, we didn't really talk about calcitriol very much, but we did also talk about parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. So you will notice for each of these, for most of these, uh, the description is going to tell you what those hormones do to either osteoclasts or osteoblasts. All right, so that's going to do it for this short little survey into chapter six. We probably could have talked about these sorts of things in much greater detail, but we only get 16 weeks in the semester, so we want to kind of make sure that we're moving along. So hopefully you don't mind that you just kind of got a crash course in this. All right, well, I thank you for your attention. That pretty much wraps up unit two, in which we discussed uh, mainly the endocrine system, among other things. So I hope you'll join us next time and we will start talking about the nervous system. Very exciting times for us. So see you next time and so long.